All right, so final unit, and it's time to talk about Gibbs free energy. So let's go ahead and jump right into our PowerPoint. Um, talking about Gibbs free energy and talking about entropy. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about changes in entropy, changes in enthalpy, and how we put all of that together to determine free energy and therefore whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. So just a quick reminder that um, according to the second law of thermodynamics for a change to be spontaneous or to be thermodynamically favored, the enthalpy change of the universe has to be positive. And we have a couple of ways that we can get to a positive change in the entropy of the universe. If both the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings change, are positive, then obviously the entropy change of the universe is gonna be positive or if there's a significant enough change in the entropy of the system, then that might be enough to overcome a negative change in the entropy of the surroundings and vice versa. So if these two things are equal and opposite, then there's no change in the entropy of the universe. And so that won't happen. But as long as the entropy of the universe is increasing, then we have a thermodynamically favorable reaction. This is true for all processes, whether we're talking about a physical process or a chemical process. So um, we're not going to go deeply into the derivation of this, but you might remember that when we talked about entropy, we said that the um, entropy of the surroundings is affected by the change in temperature. And so if we have an exothermic reaction, it's going to increase the entropy of the surroundings and that that is also affected by the temperature. And so uh, the entropy of the surroundings, the change in the entropy of the surroundings is the opposite of the change in enthalpy divided by the temperature in Kelvin. So we can put all of this together and we can write an equation for free energy and that free energy is given the symbol G for Gibbs free energy because of, um, well, it's named for the person who proposed it. And the change in free energy, if that is negative, then the process will be spontaneous. So we write all of this together into this equation, um, the Gibbs free energy equation, where we say delta G of the reaction is equal to the delta H or the change in enthalpy of the reaction minus the entropy of the reaction times the temperature in Kelvin. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So that's our mathematical expression. How can we put it all together to see how this will impact each reaction? So can we summarize this? And can we make some predictions about certain reactions that will always happen, some that will never happen, and some that are going to be dependent on temperature? So if we look at this equation, we can see that if we have a negative delta H, so this piece of our equation is negative, and a positive delta S, then we have a negative number minus a positive number. That's always going to be negative. And so delta G will always be negative. And that's sort of a reaction with a um, positive change in entropy and a negative change in enthalpy is always going to be spontaneous or thermodynamically favored. On the other hand, if we have a negative change in entropy, so entropy decreases and we have a positive change in enthalpy, so we have an endothermic reaction, then that is not going to be spontaneous at any temperature. So we have one situation where we have negative delta H and positive delta S that will always be spontaneous. We have one um, set of circumstances where we have a positive delta H and a negative delta S and that will never be spontaneous. Now, what about the other two conditions? So if we have a negative delta H, so we have an exothermic reaction, but we also have a negative delta S. Now we have a negative minus a negative, and that might be positive or it might be negative. 
when is it going to be negative? It's going to be negative if uh, temperature is low, making that T delta S contribution be small. On the other hand, if we have a positive delta H, so an endothermic reaction, and a positive delta S, an increase in entropy, then that's going to be more likely to be spontaneous at high temperature because it makes the T delta S piece of the equation be larger. And so we have a situation where we can always know that it will be spontaneous, one where it will never be spontaneous, and two, where it's going to depend on temperature. The defining factor is temperature. Now, when we talk about these reactions, when we talk about a reaction that has, um, is always spontaneous, we can talk about it being driven by both enthalpy and entropy. And if we have one that is never spontaneous, we can talk about it be also being driven by both enthalpy and entropy. Now, if we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S, so an exothermic reaction that decreases entropy, and it is spontaneous, then we would say it is driven by enthalpy alone because it's the enthalpy that causes the whole reaction to be, um, to release free energy, to, so to have a negative delta G. And conversely, if we have an endothermic reaction with an increase in entropy that is spontaneous, we say it's driven by entropy. So standard free energy change. Delta G is the change in free energy that occurs if the reactants in their standard states, so this is the standard states that we referred to in class, are converted to products in their standard states. So what are those standard states? Those standard states are one molar concentrations for solutions, everything else in its um, pure elemental form, um, one atmosphere pressure and 298 Kelvin. This standard free energy change cannot be measured directly, but it can be determined by difference. So the more negative the value for delta G standard, the farther to the right the reaction will proceed in order to achieve equilibrium. And equilibrium is always going to be the lowest possible free energy position for a reaction. And we'll come back to that when we start to talk about the relationship between delta G and K. So how can we calculate delta G? Well, we've already seen one way that we can calculate it. That's delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. We can also calculate it using Hess's law. So if we know um, a series of reactions that can be manipulated and summed, we can see that we can turn um, this bottom reaction around, this graphite plus oxygen making carbon dioxide, we can turn this around and then the oxygen and the carbon dioxide are gonna cross out. And we can see that we will get a delta G of negative three. So this is an example of a reaction that is thermodynamically favored, but is incredibly slow. We're gonna talk about kinetic control in just a few minutes. And so we have been able to find the free energy of this reaction. And then of course, the final method is the one that we've used for both enthalpy and entropy, and we can find the standard free energy of um, a reaction by subtracting the sum of the free energies of the reactants from the sum of the free energies of the products. And just as with enthalpy, the standard free energy of formation of an element in its standard state is zero. Remember, that's not the case for entropy, but it is the case for both enthalpy and free energy. All right, let's take a quick look at some practice problems. So here we have a reaction, um, potassium and chlorine reacting to form potassium chloride. And we're given a table of values for the various steps of this process. And we can see that 
the reaction producing potassium chloride from its elements goes essentially to completion. The fact that it goes to completion tells us that it is thermodynamically favorable. So we can right away rule out our answers that say it's unfavorable. And then the question becomes, is it driven by entropy or enthalpy? Well, we can see that we're going from a mole of gas and two moles of solid to just two moles of solid. So we can see that overall entropy is going to decrease. But we also see that we have a delta H value that is very negative. And so our delta H is going to drive this reaction forward. Even though we have a decrease in entropy that's working against free energy, we have an increase, uh, we have an exothermic reaction. And so we have a negative delta H. So we would say the reaction is favorable and it's driven by enthalpy change only. All right, we have another practice problem where we have the um, decomposition of methanol. So we have our methanol decomposing into carbon monoxide and two moles of hydrogen gas. And we see that it again says it goes essentially to completion and it takes place in a rigid insulated vessel that's at 600 Kelvin. We have a positive delta H value, positive 91. So we know that delta H does not favor this reaction, but we can see that we have an increase in entropy. So although the reaction is not favored by enthalpy, it is favored by entropy. We're told that it does go forward. So delta G must be negative. And it's asking us to make some inferences about delta S. Well, we know that delta G must be negative and delta H is positive. So that must mean that delta S is positive. And that agrees with what we would make the assumption that we would make about um, what's happening here. Okay, again, one more practice problem or a couple more practice problems, uh, just one more right now. So we have the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. And we have the student monitoring the decomposition of this at a constant temperature. And they record the concentration of hydrogen peroxide as a function of time. It tells us that the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. Anytime the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, we know that the sign of delta G has to be negative. So we know that we're looking at option B or option D. So then the question becomes, what is the sign of delta S? So we're going from an aqueous sample to um, two moles of liquid and one mole of gas. So we're gonna expect to see an increase in entropy. And so we're going to choose option B. Okay, we have a couple more practice problems that we'll do in class. Let's go ahead and jump forward to our next concept, which is the idea of thermodynamic control versus kinetic control. So if we go back to our kinetics, we remember that all reactions require activation energy. Some of them require a lot of activation energy and some of them only a little bit of activation energy, but all, act all reactions require activation energy. The higher the activation energy, the fewer of the collisions that would be effective collisions. And so that means that our higher activation energy reactions are going to proceed more slowly. Of course, we can always add a catalyst, which would decrease that activation energy and increase the rate of the reaction. Even some thermodynamically favored reactions may not happen at measurable rates if that activation energy is too high because the environment, the temperature or whatever might be around is not going to provide sufficient energy to overcome that activation energy. Now, you may have some reactions that don't proceed under given conditions, but proceed rapidly when an activation energy is provided. So, for example, if we want to burn something, most of the time, fires do not start spontaneously. They require some sort of a spark, whether that is lightning, whether that is um, a match or some other form of a spark. 
it does require that initial activation energy. And then it goes very quickly because the reaction itself provides the activation energy for subsequent um, molecular reactions. Anytime we have a spontaneous reaction that does not happen at a measurable rate, it's, we say that it is under what we call kinetic control. So that means that even though the reaction does have a negative free energy, the activation energy is so high that it doesn't proceed quickly enough to be measurable. Thanks, you have a good evening. Sorry. Um, okay, so we talk about some reactions that are spontaneous, but still don't happen at a measurable rate. And we consider that that's under kinetic control. All right, last practice problem for today. And I know that this font is really tiny, so I apologize in advance. But we, have, we know that the reaction of iron with oxygen forms rust. And we represent it with the equation four moles of iron plus three moles of oxygen yields two moles of iron three oxide. So our student cleans two iron nails and places each nail in a capped test tube. And we have a table down here at the bottom that gives the experimental conditions. So in one test tube, we had dry air. And in the other test tube, we had air and water. And we can see that in test tube two, we see significant amounts of rust suspended in the water and on the nail. But in test tube one with the dry air, there's no visible rust on the nail. We can see from the delta G value of negative 1,500 kilojoules per mole of reaction that this reaction is thermodynamically favorable. So why does the rust not form in test tube one? Well, we could say that <clears throat> the reaction does not occur at an observable rate when water is not present because it proceeds through a mechani mechanism with high activation energy. That certainly makes sense. Um, Gibbs free energy is not going to change with water being present or not present. The reaction is the same. Remember, this is a state function. Um, if the equilibrium constant was less than one, we'd have a very, very small G, not a large G. And the rate of reaction, oxygen molecules are not going to collide with any difference in energy, whether water is present or not. So our only valid answer then is option A. So um, as always, if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs>